How's it going, friends? Welcome to episode five of Organized Chaos. I'm so excited for you guys to hear this week's episode with Professor Ezekiel Corin. A journalism professor at UNR, I have known Ezekiel for years and consider him a mentor. Ezekiel is Argentinian born, found himself in Venezuela at one point and eventually moved to the United States for the benefit of his family. We go through his young life in South America and discuss how much of the history of Venezuela reminds him of our current political climate. The debate was on for this one, guys. So please welcome Professor Ezekiel Corin. Michael guy. I was calling him dude. And he's like, don't call me dude. <laughs> I don't mind dude. But on the other hand, bud, buddy, it's like sport. A little rough. No. Yeah, I know. All right. Well, thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. No, thank you for the for the invitation. <laughs> this would be interesting. <laughs> yeah. I've never recorded with one mic before. <clears throat> well, there's always a first time. Yeah. Well, I kind of wanted to start off by talking about your young life in Venezuela and then what brought you here to the United States. My young life. I, yeah. I, I, I love the implications of that. <laughs> um, okay, so, so where do you want to start? I mean, uh, as you know, I'm not originally from Venezuela. Mm -hmm. um, I was born in Argentina, but my parents uh, moved to Venezuela when I was one year old. So basically, I grew up you know, all my life in Venezuela. Um, but it was, it was kind of weird because at the same time, um, you know, I, I came from uh, an Argentinian family that was also very close-knit. Um, so our, our in-home dynamics were really Argentinian. And then uh, from second grade on, I went to an American school, an American international school to make things worse. Um, so I picked up a lot of things that were American and a lot of things that were from other places where, you know, I had... Uh, other students who were from Nigeria and Japan and Egypt, you name it. Um, so really, I, I grew up in this really multicultural environment. Um, and it wasn't until I got to college that I actually I, I was really immersed in Venezuelan culture as such. Okay. Um, so, you know, it, it's kind of a a very weird Venezuela that I grew up in, in that sense. Right. Um, so when did you move to Venezuela? Like what year? 1975. Um, so yeah. That's an interesting time for Venezuela too. It was an interesting time both for Venezuela and for Argentina. Um, okay. Argentina was in the midst of uh, military dictatorships, uh, you know, one after the other, particularly uh, Beginning in 1976, because of Operation Condor, uh, it got much worse. Uh, so my parents got out a little bit before that. Um, no, they were not political activists or whatnot, but nonetheless... You're affected by it. Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> um, and they moved to Venezuela as they saw it, you know, being a, a country that was on the, you'd say, on the upward trajectory. Uh, obviously, you know, we had the uh, oil embargo of the 70s, uh, and Venezuela, a big oil producing country that obviously rose the price of oil. Uh, besides, Venezuela was one of the founding members of OPEC, um, and they had just nationalized oil. So it was a, it was a really, really good time. As a matter of fact, uh, Venezuela at that time was probably Latin America's uh, fastest growing economy prosperous and, yeah it was tremendously prosperous uh you know and and that in a certain sense we we've always talked about this uh, how it if you will it, it damaged us uh you know for example we had talk about restaurants you know we had like really really good restaurants because there was a lot of money i mean you know just to give you an idea in the 70s uh air france one of the routes of, of the concord uh, was to Venezuela, to, just to give you an idea of, you know, the dimension of prosperity that we're talking about, um, and it wasn't only a small segment of the population that that was having access to this; it was rather widespread. I mean, 
every time you've talked about Venezuela, though, you're just like, I'm never going back. And of course, now with the current political climate, I can understand that. Well, certainly things have changed, you know, and 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 they changed on. Well, they <laughs> they have been changing uh, always, you know. So from that uh, from that moment of prosperity, what ended up happening was Venezuela acquired foreign debt uh, beyond what it could uh, repay. So basically, during the eighties, uh, also because it had become, you know, there, there was no incentive to produce locally or to optimize cost, would not. And when that, what ended up happening was then in the 80s, uh, we got the hangover from from the bench right. drinking of the 70s. Just too much, uh, too fast, right? Too much, too fast. Uh, you know, we were literally writing checks that we couldn't cash <laughs> as a nation. And basically it all went to, it all went to hell. Um, so economic decline in the 80s, which was also not not only in the case of Venezuela, it was a regional uh, thing, but particularly in Venezuela, it implied uh, readjustment of the currency, uh, and of course, you know. Although I did mention before that in in the seventies, this kind of wealth was widespread. Obviously enough, it was not uh, as um, as widespread as it should have been. And it was not used, a lot of corruption and whatnot, and it was not used, the the oil revenues were not used to really improve the quality of living of a vast segment of the population, which obviously enough during the 80s and then later during the 90s, the system basically uh, goes into a crisis. And that crisis is resolved. So here's here's a tie to my personal history. It's resolved in 1992 uh, when uh, Venezuela, which had been the longest running democracy in Latin America, uh, experiences a coup by led by Chavez and his and his group. That was exactly when I turned 18, which was exactly when I graduated from from high school. So I was going to college. So, you know, here am I get out of here. Well, I think. It was kind of rough, you know, uh, on one hand, because I, I was in this American school, you know, all my friends were leaving. They, they had gone elsewhere. Right. Uh, you know, some, some of them had gone back to their countries. Other were, were coming to the States to study. Um, and here was I, you know, getting like headfirst in, into Venezuela and um, society. And at the same time, you know, there's a coup happening. So... It, it's a really weird moment, um, but at the same time, you know, the the promises or the banners, let's say, that that this group had um, was carrying um, were not entirely wrong. I mean, you know, as I mentioned before, the, the corruption during the 70s and the 80s had left a, a, a vast segment of the population without, you know, Good public education, without good public health, uh, you know, so there was there was some truth to the critique to the system, and that's why it really um, generated the problems that it did, and it did eventually implode. And right, and how is it successful? I mean, yeah, they're able to recruit enough people to overthrow an already standing government. I mean, you got to have quite the well. And in that, in that moment, it failed. You know, the coup failed okay. actually, um, but. Politically, you know, a couple of years later, uh, actually by 1999, Chavez is out of prison and is leading in the polls and literally won by a landslide the elections. Um, and at first, you know, the, the situation is not that terrible. At first, there are some uh, social justice issues which are tended to, but eventually the government begins turning more and more authoritarian. And with that, you know, that, that starts spreading into every single aspect of society. Uh, you know, it's not only in politics, it's in the economy, it's in education. So it becomes a situation that is more and more restrictive. Uh, then, you know, going back to my personal life, uh, by 2009, uh, you know, we have a kid, 
and that really puts things into perspective. Uh, also, you know, not not only in terms of okay, what kind of future am I going to give her, uh, but also, you know, what kind of country are we living in? It got to a point where we couldn't take our daughter to a park, say, because the criminality was so high, and that had a political backing because the government would not uh, would not attack criminals because it was pretty much a way of controlling uh, the social order. So eventually, I was I was teaching in Venezuela uh, for a coincidental issue. Uh, I had been asked to teach a couple of courses in my alma mater, and I really liked it. To be honest, I, I had worked in marketing research for almost 25 years by then, uh, which, which is what I had done all my life, other than media production. Um, and I, I really, really enjoyed teaching. But just to give you an idea, today, you know, a full-time professor in Venezuela is going to earn anywhere from five to twenty dollars a month, uh, which is obviously not a living wage. Mm -hmm. um, and it got to a point, you know, it, it's the most coincidental thing, uh, I like to tell the story because it, it really shows the kind of life that you were leading. Um, at some point, you know, again, my daughter now is 20, 2013, so she's four years old. Um, and she is, you know, we, we want to, we want to start traveling again inside the country and showing her, uh, the country. It's a beautiful, beautiful country. Um, and then one, one, um, I think it was a, either a New Year's or a, or a Christmas Eve. Um, my wife goes to sleep. My daughter goes to sleep. And I stay watching TV. And I'm watching one of these crummy Hollywood movies. You know, really nothing to it. But it's a story about a, a bunch of kids that grow up. You know, they're, they're all on the basketball team. They grow up and uh, their coach dies. Uh, so they get all they all get together in this lake house, and they just spend a couple of days there. And Is that so, Grown Ups? I, I don't remember. Was I, it Adam Sandler? Yeah, yeah, that's it's Grown, grown ups. ups. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, no, we're we're not talking about a, a really deep movie or anything. Right. No, no. Um, but the thing is, you know, it, it sparked this idea of uh, we had gone just because of you know having a young daughter and trying to trying to give her some. Um, entertainment you could say mm -hmm. uh, we had gone to Disney a couple of times before she was five um, we had already gone like three years and it was like no I'm, I'm getting tired of all the commercial BS so no really how nice it would be to just rent a lake house and go spend I don't know a couple of weeks there so I tell my wife this and she's like no yeah that's definitely a good idea you know but why don't we go visit my cousin who lives on the western side of as well in, in this rural area called Merida why don't we go visit her? You know, it's going to be pretty much the same thing. It would not. And I'm like, you know, that, 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 that's a good idea. But, see, I'm a little comfortable traveling in Venezuela because of, again, high crime rates. It's not the best idea. And she's like, well, you know, but it's not that bad. We've, we've ridden, we've, we've done that road many times. As a matter of fact, we lived in Medellin. Nothing before. happened. Nothing happened. I mean, it, it was not this unusual thing. Mm -hmm. And literally two days later, uh, Monica Spears, who was a Venezuelan model, uh, who lived, actually she lived here in the States, she was traveling in Venezuela with her husband and their five-year-old daughter. And on that, on that route, uh, they get mugged and killed. And the only one that survives is a kid. Yeah. And the images of Monica's father taking the kid, take, taking the stuff out of the car. Um, it was seeing, you know, it was literally seeing any one of our parents doing the same thing. It's almost like a premonition yeah. to like, hey, and, don't and, do that. And that's when I said, you know, fuck it. Uh, yeah. that, 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 uh, we can't, we can't do this. Yeah. Um, and of course, you know, the, the first question, uh, being Argentinian, the, the, the obvious option would be, okay, we're, we're going to leave this and we're going to go to Argentina. Uh, but my wife made it very clear, and, and she was right. You know, all of Latin America has similar problems. At that, at that time, uh, Chavez Associates, uh, Kishners, were in power in Argentina, so it was uh, uh, it's like one not an option. Another. Yeah. yeah. As a matter of fact, that's exactly what ended up happening. Mm -hmm. uh, so 
basically it was, okay, we have to leave that as well. Uh, what are we going to do? Where are we going to go? And that's when I refloated the idea is like, you know, I really like teaching. Um, why don't we go, you know, let's go to the States at least temporarily uh, and I'll get a doctorate uh, so I can you know, become a college professor. And basically that's, that's how I ended up in the States. Yeah, you um, went to Georgia, right? Yeah. Uh, funny enough, I, w- I was actually applying. Okay, so I have an undergrad in mass communication. Then I have a, an MBA in marketing. And so, you know, my, lo- my logic was, okay, I'm going to continue in the side of business. Uh, so I was looking at business schools, really, to do a, a doctorate in business. And as I was preparing my applications, uh, you know, because it was moving an entire family, uh, my wife and I sat down and, okay, so these are the colleges that I'm thinking of applying to. Uh, you know, which ones do you like to live in and whatnot? And obviously, you know, one of those was Georgia uh, in Athens. And she was like, you know, why don't you look for some Venezuelans that live in, in Athens? So maybe, you know, there's a professor or somebody that, that could talk to you. Some and, sort of connection. Yeah, some sort of there. connection. Yeah. Yeah and give you a lay of the land. And I did, I, I found this professor, Carolina Costa Al Suru, who was in the College of Communication. And I was like, okay, you know, that's not what I'm gonna study, but why not? Um, and I reached out there and, and, and what was supposed to be like a five minute conversation ended up being like an hour and a half. Right. You know? And by the end of the conversation, she had me convinced, uh, you know, why don't, why don't you apply to Grady College? And I was like, man, you know, my background in marketing research. He's like, no, 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 apply to Grady College. Well, funny thing is, uh, I didn't get into any of the business <laughs> doctor programs, but I did get into Grady uh, yeah. with an assistantship and everything. So yeah. uh, I guess it was just meant to be. Yeah, just however you can get your foot in the door, right? Yeah, basically. Uh, you know, at our our objective at that moment was leaving Venezuela. And, and that was... Um, I always joke about it because, you know, if, if you consider that the quote unquote easiest way to leave Venezuela was actually doing a doctorate, um, that tells you how pretty desperate uh, we were. Right. You know. And it, it sounds like the whole passport being able to get over there wasn't too much of an issue, right? I mean,. The government's kind of authoritarian. They don't really want their people leaving. You know what I mean? They want to control their people, keep them there. That's kind of how their success comes from. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, you know, again, in my case, you know, I'm Argentinian. I, I, I wasn't even able to get the Venezuelan citizenship because okay, once I once I turned 18, already we had this tumultuous thing going on. Uh, so I, I wasn't even able to become Venezuelan, but obviously both my daughter and my wife are Venezuelan. Um, in my wife's case, you know, we've always had her passport up to date and whatnot. The second, and I'm not kidding you, uh, my daughter, she got her passport when she was, I think, two weeks old. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, could, again, because we had this mentality that, you know, this can go down the drain any moment. Yeah. Um, however, by the time we're going to leave, uh, her passport has expired. Yeah, getting a passport in a short amount of time. Well, getting it in a normal amount of time was, you know, months. Difficult. Uh, it was months, and eventually the process stopped. And the way things work in Venezuela, well, you know, it's who you know and whatnot. So right. we had to, to do this entire workaround. Uh, fortunately, it didn't have to pay off anybody. Um, we're willing to do so if necessary. Totally. Yeah. Uh, but no, it, it came through at the very last moment. Um, uh, but because of connections that we had, you know, doing it as a private citizen. Yeah. It, and it's only gotten worse. As a matter of fact, you know, uh, until we got our green card, we didn't want to travel particularly during the, the past administration, uh, because of the change of status, you know, a really, really quick side note, but once I was hired, uh, I began the process of getting a green card. Uh, during that first period, I, I was what's called an OTP, an optional uh, professional training. Um, and in that time, 
from the moment you get you know your work authorization until you get the green card. Uh, you have a legal status in the states, but you can't come into the states. So you need a visa. Uh, because of the animosity of the Chavez government and then the Maduro government uh, with the states, basically the U.S. Embassy in Venezuela has been closed for years. Right. So that implied, you know, also you don't even know, again, talking about the previous administration, you don't even know whether they were going to give you that, uh, that visa or not. So it was risking too much. And we didn't want to, to take chances. Now that we've decided, you know, sure, we should travel back, see family and whatnot. Um, it's scary. I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. It's tremendously scary, not only from a personal safety point of view, but, for example, my daughter right now, she's already 12. So she has to have a national identity card. And, again, you know, that to renew her, her passport. As a matter of fact, her Venezuelan passport is is expired she is you know we did her entire green card process with her argentinian passport which is up to date um so going back to venezuela implies you know the possibility of maybe not being able to leave all right stuck there forever huh well yeah kind of uh i don't know it's a scary prospect to be honest yeah i mean i can't even imagine because like over here in the states Applying for a visa to go study abroad or anything is relatively simple. You know what I mean? I mean, it's easy. You literally give the office over there at USAC all of your paperwork, and they'll send it in in mass. And then one day, I just got my passport with a visa in it. Dude, you get your passport <laughs> at, at, on campus. Yeah. Yeah. No. 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 That that you see that does not happen. Yeah. Um, and in high school, I went to Italy for a class trip. I took European history, AP European history, and. I remember it was like a week before we were going to leave and my passport expired. So we go to San Francisco and we do the process in which they do it in a day. (laughs) Can you believe that? (laughs) So we went there in the morning. We went and caught a Giants game. We came back and my visa was ready to go. Or my passport. It's like, damn, dude. A lot. (laughs) That is completely different worlds. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Absolutely. And, you know, um, some things you take for granted uh, because, you know, you think that processes like those should, and, and, and it's correct that they should be that expedite and they, and they should be that um, hassle-free. Right. Um, the world should be accessible to people who desire it. You know, ideally so. And, right. and even more when you talk about things such as, you know, identity documents and, and, and such. Uh, however, you know, many times one of the issues that, that we've encountered, particularly when you talk about education here in the States, one of the things that we've encountered is that there is a, a certain lack of understanding that other realities are different. Um, and, and just to give you an idea, uh, you know, what do you do if you need your transcripts from college? I mean, you pay you go online. 15 bucks, you do it all online and you get it within four or five days, up to a week maybe. Right. And depending, you know, I, for example, the ones from Georgia, I, I got them via email. You get a, like a secure PDF file. With, right. Yeah. Piece of cake. Piece of cake. Right. Um, for example, when my wife was going to do her master's, they requested that the university send transcripts in a sealed envelope. Yeah, they don't do that. Um. Besides, you can't order them online. You have to go to an right. office. So you had to find somebody that was willing to go to the office at God knows what time in the morning. Then and request it's not them. Like you know the person at the university who's going to no. do that for you. No, 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 no. <laughs> yeah. no, no, no. I mean, these are bureaucrats, you know. And besides, I again, if imagine if a professor is paid five bucks a month, uh, you know, it's not like uh, these bureaucrats are paid a whole lot more. As a matter of fact, they're paid less. Um, so definitely it, it's problematic and eventually, you know, it, it, whatever seems to be so easy and that you end up taking for granted as the passport or transcripts or whatnot, um, they end up being much bigger hassles, uh, in, in, in the case of Venezuela as well as in many other countries. And what's, what we've seen, and this goes back to your question of, of, you know, whether or not we would consider going back, 
um, what you end up seeing is that really just common day events, common day things that, again, you take for granted. Uh, you know, everything from going to the supermarket and finding the brands you want, or actually the products, not even brands, the products that you want or need. Um, that that becomes a that that becomes a hurdle, and it's one after the other, and really it gets to a point where your entire life is circulating around just surviving. Um, so yeah, it's it's not the it's not the most ideal situation. Right. I mean, what was so you're in Georgia, right? Yeah. You finally get there. You got your whole setup with. You're going to school. You're you're back in school. You're going yeah. for a PhD and stuff. Like, yeah. what 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 was the biggest challenge for you guys making that <laughs> shift? I mean, you're talking about food. You're talking about the education system. You're talking about, you know, just trying to get your transcripts and stuff. Oh, but my other dude. than that, you get all settled. I mean, I can't imagine there's a lot of Argentinians or Venezuelans in Athens, Georgia. Well, actually, okay. So so the let's see. Um, to be honest, the the. <laughs> There were a lot of, of, of difficult things. Um, I remember, for example, you know, the first thing we did when 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 we got to the states was well, buy a phone. I mean, right, SIM card, all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, oh God, I mean, just having to decide what carrier, uh, what plan, what phone. You know, too many options. Yeah, to do you're it. stepping I mean, into. I was, I was coming from a country where we had you know three operators. Uh, Basically, like each one had two plans, and that's about it. Yeah. All of a sudden, here I am. You know, do you want it prepaid, postpaid? Uh, you know, talk by the minute, uh, talk and text, no text, no data, data with some, data with nothing. It's like okay, holy shit, you know? Yeah, because you're stepping into a completely different world where well, you're, the you're, economy is different. Yeah, you're stepping into hyper consumerism society. You know, coming <laughs> from a, a really barren. Uh, situation. So yeah, right. it's definitely that was the first thing I remember. It, it took me. I'm, I'm not kidding you. It must have taken me like half an hour just to decide what you know what to get. And it was just give me the the first damn phone that works. That yeah. was about it. Just give me something where I can call people, and that's about yeah, it. Yeah, that was that was basically it. Um, and that also you know transpired. <laughs> I remember. Uh, do you do groceries? Yeah. Yeah. How how long? Does it take you to do a grocery run? I mean, are you talking Rayleigh's or Costco? <laughs> Either one. I mean, if you go to Rayleigh's, it just take me 20 minutes, 30 minutes to go get milk, eggs, and whatever. How about three hours? Oh, God. Dude, yeah. I mean, I'm serious. That would drive you me know, nuts. Well, yeah, but at the same time, um, you know, buy cereal. Okay. Which one? Yeah, there's a whole there's aisle. There's a whole aisle, that, yeah. yeah. Uh, not used to that as well. So those those are you know really minute things, but but they they did uh, represent some trouble. One of the good things about Athens, well, there's there's a couple of good things. Um, there, actually, there's a lot of good things, <laughs> but a couple of good things in our particular case. On one hand, we had made connection, connections both with Carolina, which I mentioned before, as well as with other Venezuelans. So we got there and, and we already knew people. Besides, you know, my daughter. Uh, had gotten accepted into a Montessori school there. And the family from that Montessori school had reached out to us because they were like our, you know, our welcoming family and, and whatnot. And we still keep in touch today. Um, so it was really, really nice having this sense of belonging, even though we had, we were just arriving. Um, on the other hand, you know, I, I know that many people tend to think of the South as you know, very particular and, and perhaps not, not in the best terms, uh, we absolutely loved it. I mean, everything from, you know, the next door neighbor who you talked to uh, and that knew absolutely everything about your life because, yes, they are nosy and gladly so. Um, to people at the university who actually seem to, to give a damn about you. Um, so it was, a, it was really a, a very fortunate place to, to get to. Um, you know, in hindsight, Reno is quite different, as I'm sure you know. Um, and to be honest, I don't know if we would have had the same reaction had we had we been elsewhere 
in the states. Uh, you know, I'm thinking of the Midwest, maybe the West Coast. Um, it it really really worked for us uh, to the point that still you know we've been in Reno for what five years now, and we still have connections with with people in Georgia. Uh, you know, we'll we'll email them all the time or call. Uh, our daughter, her best friend, is still in, in Georgia. And you know, I'm talking about five years ago, so she left when she was seven. Uh, it's not like that's your you know your friendship for life, and yet you know there they are. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, and trust me, uh, she'll FaceTime this kid for hours on end. Uh, so yeah, it, it in that sense it was it was really really easy. Uh, it, it made it made it much much easier. And then on the other hand, uh, something that was really good, and it was one of the reasons why we ended up in Georgia, um, Atlanta has, has obviously a very important airport that was e very easy to reach from Venezuela. You know, I mean, you travel, worst case scenario, you travel from Caracas all the way to Miami, and Miami, take a flight to Atlanta. It's just like an hour and a half more. Um, that's over in Reno. <laughs> you know, in Reno, you have to go through at least two stops to get here and to make things worse obviously you know nowadays uh all travel between venezuela and the u.s is is not direct flights so you have to go to a third country which makes it even more difficult mm -hmm. i mean it sounds like you guys got the best case scenario oh yeah I don't and know, you mean, must have been on cloud nine just like coming from a place like venezuela and then here you're welcomed by yeah. a whole different culture all different creeds of people and, and you're making and, friends. And really, so, yeah, yeah I'm really amazing. welcoming. And you know, the other thing is, uh, UGA is a is a very big school, um, and and they have a very vibrant foreign uh, student body. So that was not, you know, it was not as unusual uh, to have uh, to have people from different places. Uh, you know, one of my best friends from from doctorate uh, was from Korea. Uh, you know, so so you had this kind of international mentality, and it, right. it was it was really much more welcoming, um, or at least that that's how we perceived it. Yeah, everyone's not so much in the same boat as you, but you're all coming from different places, so you're all already in the mindset of, all right, these people are coming from a completely different world from me, so we're all just trying to navigate this crazy this crazy new uh, country that we've come yeah. into, you know, man, that's lucky. Oh, it was, it was certain, certainly was. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and as I said, also the, the fact that you had this, this really nice community, uh, that really, um, you know, welcomed you. There's no other way of saying it. That allowed for the transition from Venezuela to the States to be much, much easier. I will not lie. What year was that? Was that you said? That 2000? was twenty fourteen. No, oh, twenty fourteen. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Twenty fourteen to twenty seventeen. Wow. Yeah. No, I had graduated high school in twenty fifteen. Thanks for making me feel older. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not trying to make you feel older, man. <laughs> not trying to, but you are. Um, well, you, you asked before. You know, what was one of the hardest things? Well, to be very honest, uh, perhaps the hardest thing for me was. Starting my doctorate when I was forty. Um, no, totally. You know, and I I hadn't studied. Well, first of all, I hadn't studied in English since high school, uh, so that was pretty much of a change. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I hadn't written a paper in English for what twenty years. Right now, you're in this. I mean, you're in a doctorate program, right? So, so you know, you're, you're, you got to you got to write good papers. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> it helps. Uh, fortunately enough, you know, I, I I've always been kind of a strong writer, so that that actually worked to my favor. Right. Um, but then I hadn't studied, dude. Uh, I graduated from my MBA when I when in two thousand nine, so I hadn't studied for some good eight years right and i can imagine um, studying in venezuela for venezuelan schools can be a little bit different than well, a university kind of not 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 as much i mean not too bad. again the mba was was in a school that was um it, it's actually one of these schools that has international uh accreditation from i don't even remember what letter 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 <laughs> organization um so it, actually they used the harvard case uh, model 
So it, it was pretty much the same thing. Okay. Um, but what was hardest, to be very honest, uh, going back to the age thing, is that I was studying with kids who were just coming out of their undergrad. Right. 24, uh, 25. Yeah. So, you know, all of a sudden, here you are in the classroom, uh, you know, where you really don't fit in. As a matter of fact, you're closer in age, if not sometimes over the age of the professor, and you're here sitting with your classmates who you <laughs> nearly double in age. So that was quite something. That's almost, that's like me going to uh, like eighth grade. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it's quite something. Yeah. Um, I mean, eventually, you know, you get used to it and whatnot, but, yeah. Well, what was, what was the, like, trend, like, because you have a certain taste, like, now I'm going to talk about food. Like, you have a certain taste for Venezuelan food and all that stuff. And coming to Georgia, I mean, southern food is vastly different. I mean. That's good. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> like, what was it like just sitting down at a restaurant or going to a food truck or something like that and getting, like, some southern barbecue or something like that? Well, you know, again, in, in, in my particular case, um, this really wasn't that much of an issue. Um, remember that, you know, as I, as I mentioned before, I grew up in an Argentinian household. So, basically, the food I grew up with was Argentinian, more mm -hmm. than Venezuelan. Okay. Um so, and, 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 I'm, and I'm really used to having, like, both my wife and I cook a lot and fairly well, uh, at least decently well. Mm -hmm. So, really, we, we do keep our, our culinary traditions at home. Okay. Um, and, and you're able to find ingredients yeah. and stuff. Well, you know, again, because of the situation in Venezuela, it has gotten worse over the years. Um, as a matter of fact you start seeing, and even here in Reno, you start finding products that are, you know, Venezuelan. And, well, nowadays you can even have them shipped from where, from wherever. But, um, yeah, that, that was not an issue. There are some products that you can't find. For example, there's, there's this kind of sweet pepper that we use for basically every single stew or sofrito. Uh, and that you can't find. Right. Uh, well, that, it is what it is. I mean, when you're in a place like Georgia, though, you're like, man... This food down here is pretty good. I'm okay oh, with it. No, no, I, I had, I, trust me, I had no trouble at all. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm, I do like Venezuelan food. I do like Argentinian food. Uh, dude, but I, I, I can go very well with some biscuits and, <laughs> and country fried steak. Yeah, I, I'm good. Right, yeah, I mean, you can't go wrong with that stuff. No, no, no. I mean, we fry everything, but it's pretty damn good, so... Yeah. Um, Dude, I've, I've always wanted to have, like, legitimate southern food, especially, like, Cajun food, oh, yeah. too. I've always wanted to go to Louisiana and start trying some food down there one of these days. You have to. Yeah. It is. Yeah. It is quite the experience. Yeah. Well, I remember a conversation we had earlier in the year, is around the time of the election, and you were expressing fears of how a lot of the political situations in Venezuela you were beginning to see here in the States. Yeah. And how how has that kind of gone from when we had that conversation? Because a lot, a lot has gone down. Oh, yeah. We had a pandemic. We had a change in administrations. Um, we're going through some pretty insane turmoil. And you were saying you were very fearful of some of the authoritarian ideologies down in Venezuela kind of peaking their early signs of that same ideology peaking its head in the U.S. And how is that? Well, your head. let's see. Um, you know, whenever you try to make a comparison between different countries and societies, it, it, it becomes very complicated because there is no way in which to compare apples to apples. Okay? Totally. I mean, I mean, there are, they have historical developments that are different and right. whatnot. We're a really young country. Well, yeah. And, and you know, again, as I, as I was telling you the story of Venezuela, you know, the, the entire development of the of the oil boom in the seven in the seventies and the exacerbated corruption of the eighties and the foreign debt and whatnot, obviously the U.S. didn't have that development. Right. Okay. Um, and if we go back further in time, even our our you know our nationhood, how it was formed as a nation, 
was completely different from that of the U.S. Now, that being said, um, the point I was making when, when we were having that conversation um, was that there are certain aspects that might seem rather minute at the moment, but that because you have seen them play out in time, uh, eventually they become much bigger. Let me give you an example. Um, <laughs> and it's going to be a, a dumb question, but of which I know the answer, of course. Have you ever bought a new pair of shoes? Yeah. No. Okay. Have you ever tried them on? And when you try them on, they're a little bit uncomfortable? No. Yeah. What do you do? I mean, either you break them in or you take them back. Okay. So let's say you don't take them back, right? You wear them. And you go out for a walk. Maybe, I don't know, you walk a couple of blocks. And that little thing that started to bother you at the store now bothers you a little bit more. Eh, you might, you know, you might say, well, I'm not going to wear them as often or whatnot. But let's say you do keep on wearing them. And then the next walk you take is, say, a five-mile walk. And eventually you start seeing that, it, that that little thing that bothered you gives you a blister. Next time you go buy shoes, what are you going to do with the first time you try them on and there's something that bothers you? You're going to be like, it, hell yeah, no. No, you're over it. You're, cause, why? Because you know how it's going to play out. Right. Something very similar to that is what, what I was talking about. You see, because of the way the, the Trump administration um, was articulating some policies, and particularly towards the media and also towards political opposition, those were the little things in the show that, that I had felt before. Um, the thing is, I did not return those shoes on my first way around. Yeah, the the second time that I went into a store or a country, and I felt that uncomfortable little thing in in the shoe. Yeah, uh, I know how it plays out. And you know, for example, something like what happened on January sixth, um, that was completely foreseeable. Totally, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you see. I, I remember us talking about this, you know, not only around the elections, but even prior to that. Uh, and I was telling you this exact same thing. You know, one of the reasons why I, I do not like the Trump administration was precisely because of that authoritarian tint, which we kept on seeing. So things like, you know, January 6th uh, attack on, on the Capitol uh, and things that are to come, unless the system does put... Uh, uh, certain guardrails, um, it is going to get worse. And that is my fear. I've always kind of had this idea that the, not the main reason why the um, attack on the, the Capitol happened, but I think a, a big reason it did happen was I think the majority of these people felt censored in a certain way. Their voices weren't being heard. And I mean, when you start censoring a people, they're going to take actions into their own hands. And I feel that's exactly what happened. Um, so I think censorship is a, is a huge problem and something that, like January 6th, could happen again and even on an even bigger scale. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I, I can see the point of uh, censorship, um, although, to be very honest, uh, I am quite uncomfortable about talk, talking about censorship uh, in, in those totally. terms. And the reason for that, you know, again, um, when you sign up, say, for example, in the case of, let, let's, let's try to narrow this down. You know, in the case of Twitter, for example, uh, censoring XYZ okay. conservative. Um, when you sign on to a private platform such as Twitter, you sign up for terms of service. If you are in violation of those terms of service, just like any private enterprise, they have the right to refuse service. I am quite uncomfortable with that notion of that being censorship. I can flip the coin and tell you, well, that is, you know, enterprise freedom. 
And ultimately, yeah, it is. Now, again, mind you, I'm comparing censorship in those terms to censorship in the terms that we have in Venezuela, where little, literally, right. you, know, you have a journalist, for example, that might be jailed because of something they published. Of so, course. Yeah. Well, I mean, accidents happen, as the government <laughs> says. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so again, you no. Know, I'd like to put an asterisk on that censorship. Okay. Now, that does not that does not do away with the feeling that the media are somehow, um, I don't want to say ganging up against, but that present a different point of view uh, and that do not privilege those voices. Now, one thing that you have to take into consideration, Drew, and, and this is something that we've seen, you know, now I'm, now I'm not talking as, as, a, as a political person, but as a, as a media scholar, uh, one of the things that we have seen is that the conservative media scape has become more and more radicalized over time, while the more liberal media scape has remained pretty much along the same lines. Yes, uh, and, and there's there's plenty of studies on this. There's okay. plenty of scholarship on this. So what ends up happening really is, is not a question of greater polarization, but there is a question of a presentation as though there were more polarization. As, as those tend to go to extremes, obviously enough, you know, things such as conservatives are being silenced um, tend, to, tend to have more grasp on segments of the population, which obviously enough becomes problematic because then there is no way of bring them back into the fold of, of a democratic process if you, you know if, if you can't accept those fringe far right ideas as being part of the normal. Okay, I have two things. Yes. So when you say that Twitter is a private company, yeah, yeah they are a private company. Um, I kind of think we have to rethink what these huge companies are. Because, I mean, you got Twitter, you have Facebook, um, and Google, Amazon even. I mean, these guys are, these enterprises are, are affecting elections. They're affecting people's lives, and not only in the United States, oh, no. but in other countries. Yeah, definitely. I mean, when you buy a phone, I can't remember what country it is, but when you buy a phone in this said country, it has Facebook already pre-installed on yeah, it. Let me correct you on that. It's not a country. They actually have a deal with all the major African uh, That's carriers. What yeah, okay. Yeah, so basically what, what ends up happening is that uh, Facebook has this, you know, cut a deal with, with uh, service providers, and basically any traffic that goes through Facebook does not eat up on your data. Uh, so just right. imagine what that means. Right. Mm -hmm. um, well, you can say it's a private company, right? But when they are so influential in these in these aspects, I mean, we kind of have to rethink how we treat these companies. Because, I mean, you can't just always say, oh, it's a private company, they can do what they want. I mean, dude, when they have so much influence over the world, you kind of have to start rethinking the idea of public versus private companies. Would you agree with that? I mean... Okay, so <laughs> here... Two things on my side now. Okay. Uh, yes, definitely. Let, let me let me just let me let me uh, try to clarify a couple of things. Uh, they are a private company. Whether or not they should be more regulated, that is. I, I don't think they should be more regulated. That though. that is a completely different thing. Well, right. What you're talking about is regulation. Well, I another. I do disagree with the government intervening with those private companies. Then how do you, then? I don't know. Wait, that's wait, the wait, thing, though. True, true. It's like that's a, this is where the problem. Hold comes on for up. a second. But right, you said that you need to rethink that notion of private versus public. Uh, the one that is entrusted with doing that is the government. It's the government. I understand. So, you know, you you can't have it both ways. You can't say we need <laughs> to rethink this. At I'm the more, same time I'm more say, opposing. Uh, no, but I'm a, I'm, I'm opposed to regulation. <laughs> Because it's exactly You're the right. same thing. You're right. It's like wanting to take a shower but not wanting to get wet. That, <laughs> that don't happen, my dude. Right, right. I'm just saying. I'm just posing this big problem that we have 
with these companies becoming so big, and then you have you you would then point to the government to say, hey, fix it, but they're not going to make it any better. Well, so that that's I'm more I'm more saying this is the issue that we have. Look, there's there's the the second issue, and it's connected to what you just said. The second issue is you know when we look at the mediascape, you know, and and here I'm talking both the mediascape in terms of newer media such as internet companies or platforms as well as older media first of all you have an, uh, an issue of concentration obviously enough you know and, and and because of corporate mergers and whatnot basically in terms of mainstream media we're talking about five large groups that dominate the the mediascape and in terms of newer media or internet uh, ventures as you pointed out you know it's only a handful of players definitely enough they have an, an overwhelming power, and, and they exert that power, uh, you know, sometimes directly and sometimes in very subtle ways. Mm -hmm. uh, the subtle ways are a little bit more scary, in my opinion. Well, I mean, yes, definitely so. Uh, you know, it, it, and as a matter of fact, uh, in the course that I'm teaching right now, this is one of the topics that we deal with. And particularly, you know, there's, there's things that you don't even talk about, you know. For example, uh, you know, any of this media, they take for granted capitalism. You know, why? That is, that is part of a worldview that is sold through the, this entire mediascape. You know, why don't you have any, any other alternative to capitalism? Or, you know, we can, we can go down the line of any sort of social issue. Um, now, the other problem that you have with these companies, such as Facebook, Amazon, etc., is that because they, they are in that very narrow loophole of not being media companies, because, mind you, media companies are regulated, and they've, they've been regulated for years, yeah. uh, precisely because of the large influence that they had on society, on shaping the views of the populace, Precisely because of that, there is this this sense of regulation and necessary regulation, if you will. However, because of these companies not being classified as media companies, but rather being classified as tech companies. Right, private entities that provide a service, right? Right. They fall into this kind of gray area where they are allowed to be, let's say, not beholden by those regulations. Now... Going back to your to your uh, question about whether or not censorship or you know enforcing a terms of services in these companies is is correct or not, I'm not arguing that it is. Right. I'm arguing that that is legally what they can do. Right. If we don't like that, that's got to change. And again, um, although you might not like it, that implies regulation. Right. But. If you no, know, if those are the 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 rules of the game, uh, you can't blame them for playing that game. Right. Okay. And it's just like in baseball, you can't you know you can't blame the pitcher for pitching too fast. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Right. I mean that that's what they're expected to do. If you and I, I guess it's uh, it's a problem with a the whole country's mentality. I mean, they are they they need to have Twitter, they need to have Instagram to run their businesses and stuff like that. I mean, we're all addicted to this this weird thing that we haven't quite caught up to in a way. Um and I think that's the whole other issue in and of itself, you know. Um if we keep feeding into this mass hatred, mm -hmm. nothing's really going to change. I mean, these guys are still going to be making as much money as they are. And then, oh, actually, they make more. Totally. Yeah, yeah. exactly. They're just going to keep increasing. And then to them, it becomes a game, right? They're, yeah. they're, they're competing with each other. Mark Zuckerberg's totally competing with Bezos, Bezos with Musk, and all these other absolute titans in Silicon Valley, you know? No, I mean, we're, we're looking now that they're, that they're just trying to figure out who has a bigger one. A rocket, that is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no kidding. I mean, better to be more addicted to the space race than... <laughs> you know, dominating elite media landscape. But you see, and, and now that jokingly we, we delved into the, the space race or the private space race, we should say, um, that, is, that is precisely 
one of the issues that, that's collateral, collateral to all this that we're mentioning, and it's this idea of you know, privatizing everything, even even truth, and even you know areas which, as we mentioned before, perhaps should be thought of more as a public service rather than as a private entity. Because I always thought Twitter should be just open to whatever. You know, I, and and that's kind of a tough argument to make because you don't because kids go on there. You know what I mean? You can't be having hateful rhetoric, but that's what the First Amendment is all about. I mean, you kind of have to have these people spew dumb arguments online so so that more speech can be implemented instead Dude. of taking it away. Because then you can make the argument of why that person is yeah, wrong. I agree. You know what I mean? Question: Do you remember the First Amendment? Yes, of course. Can you recite it? No, I can't recite it. Oh, come on. I'm All sure right, you can. Look it up. Yeah, let's go ahead. Here. Right. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, let's go. First Amendment. Yeah, look at that. Just pops up. Of course, it doesn't protect harming others. No, no, I no. I understand no. that. Chill out. Chill out. I would like for you oh, to God. read it. I'm there scared. You go. <laughs> I'm there scared. You go. go ahead. Read it. All right. Congress shall... Wait, wait. Make... Sorry, who? Congress. Oh, Damn. That's how far you got. Mm. I see what you mean, though, but, I mean... The protection of the First Amendment is a protection from the government limiting free speech. Okay. But then my mind just goes back to how much power are we going to let Twitter have over the media landscape in which it influences everybody's lives. I fully agree with you. Yeah, Drew. so it's a tough issue. It is. It is <laughs> it, it, well, definitely it is a tough issue. Because we're all addicted to Look, just opinions, dude. We're not addicted to truth or the or you know what the right's doing or what the left's doing based on fact. We're addicted to Rachel Maddow on CNN yeah. going off on whoever it is. Listen, Drew. Uh, one, you know, an example that I that I always like to give. Uh, when when we discuss this, is that of Pornhub. And, okay. and, you know, why Pornhub? Um, Pornhub, some years ago, started having a program of verified models and verified amateurs. Okay. Do you find any anything problematic with that? No. No. Would you be as kind as to tell me... Here, let me ask you a, a simple question. <laughs> I don't know where this is it, going. You're going to see it. <laughs> Okay. Is pornography a depiction of actual? No. no it's, so it's not a real depiction of intercourse and whatnot? Yeah, but Pornhub doesn't have influence over the election. No. You see, but our sense of being able to accept that a private company, a private company that is, whose mission literally is to, if you will, deceived you, yeah, with a fantasy, which is pornography, if you are willing to accept the fact that, sure, they'll deceive you on that, but not on whether or not, you know, user XXX is a model or right. an amateur. Like this is a real person. Okay. Right? If you are willing to displace that, that sense of truth Onto this company that whose mission again is to lie to you, right? How can you expect any of these other companies to hold truth as a, as an ultimate value? We are displacing, and, and and that's where I was going with all this. And okay. you know, not to talk about pornography, <laughs> no problem there. But the point being that we are displacing central elements of so of the social world onto the hands of these companies. Again, take the case of Facebook, as you mentioned right. before. You know, whether or not something is true, how does Facebook solve it? Well, well, we'll change the algorithm. You know, there's hate speech on Twitter. How do we solve it? Oh, no problem. We'll filter out this and that. When really the problems, the social problems that underlie all of these issues are just being absconded. Right. And they're just being skirted right. away. I think we're both we're, we're both pointing to it's a societal issue. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, of course. I mean, but again, you know, you can't you can't separate the media from society. I mean, these are not two 
different entities, if you will. Media are social institutions, and as 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 such, you know, they work within the social world. Yeah, I mean, it, it, still though, I still feel like we got to do something about how big these companies are. But yeah, I I understand. I think that is a great metaphor to to make between Pornhub and like a, a company like Twitter. Um, but man, dude, n- nobody goes onto Twitter thinking, oh, these opinions aren't actually verified opinions. You know what I mean? Like that blue little check mark doesn't really mean too much. So Actually, like I said, again, we're so addicted to opinions. Like yeah, the, the I, armchair warrior from Alabama saying he's from New York and he's a 34 year old, whatever. Yeah. You know, I, absolutely. Absolutely. We get absolutely outraged. And then the media just fills that outrage, yeah. makes it even worse. Well, I mean, it, it sells. You know, totally. Let's, let's exactly. Clear. So how do you how do you change something like that? I mean, you got to change the whole business model, but the whole business model has worked for so many years. So it's like, yeah, I mean, journalists feel listen, like uh, you're, you're, go not, you're not going to change the business model because, no, again, no, right. we've gotten to that business yeah. model because it works. Mm-hmm. Um, perhaps too idealist to me, uh, but the way I you know in, in my small sphere of influence try to change that is precisely by trying to promote media literacy amongst my students and right. my colleagues and friends and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the issues, and, and we've seen this with every single new medium that has come along, you know, we we get a medium, we develop a medium, and then we start using it. We eat it up like it was, yeah. you know, cold pizza after, after, a, after Sitting drinking. Sitting in the fridge, yeah. yeah. But the problem is that it, it takes years and time to actually develop knowledge about right. the effects of those media, uh, how to how to properly use them, uh, the risks of, of those media. Um, I agree, because I think the technology has far surpassed anything we could have imagined even just five, ten years ago. And now we are just mentally being able to catch up to it. I but, do agree that the pendulum has swung so far, and it's going to start coming back, but... I don't know. I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's not looking great. <laughs> no, it's, not, it's really not looking great. Yeah. Uh, it's it, really not looking great. And, you know, if we, if we look, if we just glimpse into the future, uh, you know, there's, there's some very problematic things that are coming down the pipeline. Uh, take deep fakes, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, that is, that's going to be a game changer. And it's freaky. And it's, it's tremendously freaky. Um, just to give you an idea of, of you know, going back to this notion of not only media literacy, but even regulation, how far behind it, it lags, um, there's only three states, three states that have some sort of regulation on deep fakes. And that is, that is upon us. Yeah. I mean, that, that's literally... Mm, that's just talking the, about one issue. Yeah. yeah. And that's in, in the blink of an eye, we're going to start seeing deep fakes of everything you can possibly imagine. I mean, I watched a video, and I was like, there's something wrong with this video. It's like, I'm not sure. And it was, they then explained this technology was a deep fake, mm-hmm. and we were able to mimic this person's voice. Yeah. This person doesn't even exist. Yeah. I'm like, dude, I barely caught on that this there was something a little bit wrong. I mean, and if the technology is already here with and this. And mind you, you are a professional. You're a professional photographer. You're a professional videographer i mean you're you have a trained eye yeah you, you've for sat, someone who's yeah you've sat you know editing exactly. for hours so yeah your eye is more likely to catch that mm-hmm. now mind you you know i i post that video at what at a small resolution say what 480 uh, resolution i post that on online it becomes viral that's done yeah that's it's freaky man and especially with just picking up someone's voice yeah, and taking any amount of audio that they've done, especially with how popular podcasts are and how many episodes are out. You can pretty much have anyone say whatever you want. Yeah. It's crazy stuff. And then you tack that along with a, with a video. I mean, how much, how much can you really trust anymore? And then you could, then the vibe becomes even worse. Yeah. Again, you know, and, and that is just, as you said, that is just one one thing. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) 
Definitely. It, it, it's going to get much more problematic. Uh, you know, technology is going to keep on evolving. Mm-hmm. Definitely. Um, oh, it's not stopping. Dude. Definitely. One of the things that, that I am tremendously happy about is the fact that at least now we, we've, we've broken that notion that technology is unproblematic. You know, there's, there's various areas that have studied, for example, algorithms and how they, they can be biased and help promote uh, biased views of, of the world. So th- certainly there, there are some positive things coming out of this, particularly from the critical side. Uh, but it, it is risky and it's not going to get much better, too. Think it'll ever get better? As far as the pendulum swung too far, it's going to break out of its... Um, I, I am, honestly, I, I'm a pessimist. Um, I don't think it's going to be Whereas I'm better. a little bit more optimistic. But but you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> All right, dude. Let's go get spears. We did. We did an hour. Hey. That was perfect. I thought I thought we wouldn't have something to talk about for an hour. Really, dude? Um, yeah. You don't think I was good at that? That is it for today's episode of Organized Chaos. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, be sure to like, subscribe, and share the show. Show some love and let me know how you feel. Thanks again for listening. I'm Drew Winklemeyer. This is Organized Chaos. Peace.